Hi, I'm Giselle. I'm an academic at the University of Cape Town and founder of Nudging Financial Behaviour, a company which aims to empower businesses and individuals to make better money decisions. Practically though, I spend most of my time speaking to financial planners, at least planners who understand that their job's not about managing money, but rather managing humans. So obviously I was really excited when I was given the opportunity to come and speak at this conference. And sort of a lot of different things went through my mind about things I could talk about, but something I settled on was to talk about risk. I think it's a really important concept to understand and something that has big implications for your clients. It's something you need to get right because if you sort of measure your client's risk tolerance incorrectly, you can end up in a situation where they potentially have a very risky portfolio which needs more frequent rebalancing, or on the other ends of it, you can have one that doesn't actually meet the sort of investment returns they want to be earning. So I think it's an important thing to talk about. And also, I recently did a very rudimentary study where we looked at risk tolerance questionnaires. And for those of you that are using questionnaires, I think the findings from the study might be useful to you. So that's sort of how I'm going to do the talk. I'm going to end off with some sort of practical suggestions about where in the client journey I think you can have these discussions, where you can look at how to apply these outcomes practically for your clients. But before we begin, let me tell you a story about how the idea for the study came about. I had a student come into my office one day and tell me, Hey, so I was checking out some stuff on Google last night and I saw this link to a questionnaire that where you could access your risk tolerance. Uh, anyway, so I did it and I got my outcome. And a bit later, I saw another link to another risk tolerance questionnaire. So I did that one too, and I got my result. But what was, what was confusing was that the two outcomes were completely different. Like, how does that make sense? It doesn't. The same person should get the same outcome, irrespective of the method that we're trying to diagnose their risk tolerance, right? Because risk tolerance is based on your unique personal characteristics and biases, not the means by which we're testing it. Before we dive in, let's quickly unpack some terminology. When I refer to risk aversion, I'm referring to an investor's preference for certain payoffs rather than uncertain payoffs. Okay, so investing in cash is a certain payoff. Investing in equity is an uncertain payoff, right? That's why investors demand a higher risk premium in equity markets. This is behavioral finance stuff. And what psychology does is it divides this behavior of ours into two domains. We have the effective domain, which deals with our emotions, and the cognitive domain, which deals with our thinking function. But we need to understand both effective and cognitive biases to truly understand a client's risk aversion. Loss aversion is a completely complex behavioral bias, arguably, in my opinion, the most complex behavioral bias, because it's sort of influenced by so many different things. And while we like to sort of throw the word risk aversion around, the reality is that most of us and most of your clients aren't actually risk averse, we're loss averse. Okay? And the best and only way I can explain a loss aversion to you is by using a picture. So I'm going to use um, Kahneman and Tursky's prospect theory to explain this to you. This graph starts with a line that shows our gains and losses. So if that's the middle point, we might be saying, okay, that's a gain of 100, that's a loss of 100. There's then another line, which I'm going to try and draw straight, which shows how we might feel about those gains and losses. So these are happy feelings, these are not so happy feelings. Now, if we felt the same way about a gain and we did about a loss of the same magnitude, you'd expect to see a straight line over there, but it's not what we see. What we actually see, which is quite tricky to draw, is something like that. Okay, so if we look at that gain of 100, take it up over there, that's the amount of happiness we feel about gaining that 100. If we look at that loss of 100, right, that's how much sadness we feel about losing that 100. So what we can see from this prospect theory, which is sort of graphically explaining loss aversion to us, is that we value losses more than we value gains of the same magnitude. Now, loss aversion and risk aversion are interrelated and, and they can sort of change in different market cycles. So there's a lot of stuff around there around investor sentiment, can how that changes the way we feel about risk. 
But if you think about the word sentiment, it's got to do with emotions. It's not justified by fact. Okay, technicalities out of the way. Let's now talk about the things that are actually shown to influence our risk tolerance. Risk tolerance differs from one individual to another and is a function of personal and socioeconomic characteristics. The first of these is your personality. If you've got a high self-esteem, you're going to be better equipped to handle risk and better equipped to handle the anxiety of losses. If you're into sensation seeking, you also have higher risk tolerance. According to the Myers-Briggs personality type test, if you're a type A individual, so you're confident, impatient, aggressive, even hostile in some scenarios, again, you're going to have a higher risk tolerance compared to type B individuals who have the opposite characteristics. The next thing to consider is age, which has many determinants at play. If we first think about the generational effect, this refers to how sort of the socioeconomic environment of each generation influences that particular generation and doesn't change with age. So an example of this, if we think about the silent generation born in the 20s and 30s, they lived through the Great Depression. That obviously results in them having a lower tolerance for risk. Compare that to Generation Xs that were born in the late 60s and 70s. They enjoyed more prosperity than their baby boomer parents. So these things influence our generation and influence our risk tolerance and don't change with our age. But the period and the aging effect does change our risk tolerance with age. And there's sort of a general understanding that your risk tolerance does sort of reduce with age, which makes sense. Your investment horizon is getting shorter, your human capital is depreciating. But it's actually more like a reverse euro humpback shape. Right, so what we mean about that is that our risk tolerance sort of increases in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and this sort of comes down sort of in the later years of our life. So a lot of things to consider with age. Next, let's consider your level of income. And this one makes sense, right? The more you earn or the more money you have, the greater you're going to be able to handle risk, right? Because you've got greater financial capacity to handle losses that come from that risk. So that's level of income. Next to consider is gender. With gender, generally, women are more conservative than men are. But here's where another bias comes into play, which is overconfidence. Right? Men are more overconfident than women are. So men tend to be overconfident about their risk tolerance, and women tend to be underconfident about their risk tolerance. So that also predisposes us to conclude that men are more risk tolerant than women. I actually can't be objective on this point, so I'm going to move on. Next, we have marital status and dependence. The rationale of these two is exactly the same. As soon as you have more people to take care of than just yourself, naturally, you're going to be more cautious. Finally, we have financial literacy. And financial literacy differs from one person to the next, but it's positively related to our risk tolerance. Now, you need to be careful when you read any stuff around financial literacy because often there's proxies that are used to measure them. But for the majority of the cases, the results are really promising and they show that financial literacy can actually reduce the effect of other biases. So an example of this, advanced financial literacy in women has been shown to reduce the effect of gender on risk tolerance. These are the things that influence our risk tolerance. Now that we know what influences risk tolerance, how do we measure it? For purposes of our study, we looked at questionnaires, not only because it's the simplest method, but also because it's most commonly used. But because of that, those questionnaires need to be psychometrically sound, right? They need to assess both cognitive and effective elements. They need to be valid and reliable and they cannot have any form of self-assessments in them, right? Self-assessments are weak. Nobody knows how they're gonna feel about losing money until they actually lose money. And finally, there needs to be sufficient questions in them. Generally, most of the literature says about 25 questions to accurately look at all the domains of risk. We'll come back to the limitations of these questionnaires in a little while, but for now, what our study tried to do is we just tried to determine would the same individual get the same risk tolerance outcome, irrespective of the questionnaire that they used?
these questionnaires are being used worldwide. And because of that, we can only assume that investment recommendations are being made off of them, not only potentially by financial planners, but maybe by investors directly. So what did we do? We started by speaking to financial planners and going online and trying to access as many risk tolerance questionnaires as we could. We found risk tolerance questionnaires from the US, UK, South Africa, Canada and India. Once we'd done that, we needed to create some hypothetical individuals. We need someone who was highly risk tolerant and someone who had almost no risk tolerance. And to do that, those very characteristics we just spoke about, we went and we assigned them to different hypothetical individuals. Once we'd done that, we then looked over those questionnaires to see, is there anything that we missed, right? Is there anything that they're asking that we haven't actually assigned to an individual? And there were some things. Unfortunately, self-assessment stuff, right? How would you feel after you lose all your money? A waste of a question. But anyway, for purposes of completeness, we needed to go and give a behavior to each of those hypothetical individuals. Okay, let's meet them. First, we have Lily. She can only handle a little bit of risk. She's a 75-year-old married female with dependents. She's managed to continue working, but earns a low income and only has basic financial literacy. Then we have LeMay who can handle a little more risk. She's also a working woman with dependents, but earns slightly more and has slightly better financial literacy. She's 65 years old. Next, let's meet Michael, who can handle a fair bit of risk. This is a 29-year-old male with no dependents. He's employed, earning a pretty decent salary, and has a fairly good level of financial literacy. Finally, we have Harney. He is our highly risk tolerant individual. This is a 45 year old male with no dependents, employed, earning well, and has advanced financial literacy. Hopefully you can see how their names match to low, low to medium, medium to high, and high risk tolerance. Now, before we continue, yes, we do recognize that these individuals may not exist in real life. They're merely prototypes that are meant to reflect extreme manifestation of risk aversion. But that doesn't hinder what we're trying to do over here. We're trying to assess the validity and the reliability of the questionnaire, not necessarily the appropriateness of the individual. What we then did is we took each of the questionnaires and we completed them four times, once for each of the individuals that we created. And then what we wanted to know was whether the results were in line with the expected outcome for each of the individuals, and whether they were consistent amongst the different questionnaires. These were the results. The first thing we can see is that there's some comfort for Lily. 85% of the outcomes said she had low risk tolerance. That tempers any concern that Lily might hold an excessively risky portfolio based on the output of these questionnaires. So that was good to see. When looking at LeMay, the impact of binary variables starts to become apparent. So if we think about income as an example, that can be nicely split amongst four hypothetical individuals, but not gender, right? That we couldn't perfectly divide into four. So that's why the two lower risk tolerant individuals are both female and the two higher risk tolerant individuals are both male. Because of that, you can expect to see some similarity between Lily and LeMay and then similarities between Michael and Harney. But there were sufficient non-binary variables that should have shown better differentiation between these two. We do see slightly less low risk tolerance outcomes for LeMay and one high risk tolerance outcome, but not as much as we would have liked to see. And that just begs the question as to whether there might be an over-reliance on variables such as gender or having financial dependence, which is another binary variable. Moving to the boys. For Michael, we can see that 60% of the questionnaires gave him a medium to high risk tolerance outcome, which was good to see. For both Michael and Harney, there were two questionnaires that said they had low risk tolerance, which doesn't make sense. We dug a little deeper and noted that both these questionnaires originated from a retirement fund in South Africa. And then we looked at the questions in more detail. Most of them related to capital preservation. This perhaps makes sense for a retirement fund, but we got the sense that there was a bit of framing around capital preservation within these questionnaires. 
The thing we didn't like from the outcomes was that only 15% for Michael and 25% for Hani gave a high risk tolerant outcome. This analysis showed us that, for the most part, the questionnaires are able to distinguish between extremes, like high and low risk tolerance. However, they struggle to distinguish that middle ground. And the same individual is not getting the same outcome. For Lily, she only got three different outcomes, but for the other three, at some point, they got all four possible outcomes. That is not what we wanted to see. Overall, the questionnaires tend to underweight a person's risk tolerance. So the risk is not that they're going to hold an excessively risky portfolio, but rather that they're going to hold a portfolio with lower risks than they're willing to take, which is then going to sacrifice returns. In addition to these results, when we were going through the questionnaires, we picked up some other qualitative findings. Firstly, there were just too few questions. On average, the question heads had six to 10 questions, which isn't sufficient to assess risk tolerance. There was too much redundancy and there was too much self-assessment. And I think I've sort of hammered this point enough. Self-assessment doesn't work. It's a waste of a question. Finally, after all that effort we went to going through the literature and seeing what are the things that actually influence risk tolerance, we didn't see them in the questionnaires. Of all the questionnaires, only two had questions relating to either age, gender, marital status, dependence, or income. And none of the questionnaires had any questions relating to personality type, self-esteem, or even financial literacy. Now, we do recognize that, particularly for a financial planner, this questionnaire isn't going to be the only time that you're gathering information from your client, right? You might already know their age, their gender, their marital status through other client engagement. But for somebody who's doing these questionnaires online, which was some of the questionnaires in our sample, where else is that information being drawn from? Furthermore, when it comes to things like personality type and financial literacy, we're a little bit more skeptical about whether that information actually is being assessed. And if these things are as important as the literature suggests they are in determining risk tolerance, a greater emphasis should be placed on them. So our key findings were as follows. Risk tolerance questionnaires are risk averse. Only 10% of our output said that any individual had high risk tolerance, whereas 44% said that they had low risk tolerance. Okay, this means that investors aren't potentially going to have an excessively risky portfolio, but one that's too conservative for the risk that they can actually withstand. Secondly, there were just too many missing variables. And the extent to which these variables are missing is difficult for us to say, right? Because we're not sitting there in the room with the client. But this is perhaps something that you can consider for yourself. Think about the questionnaires or the tools that you use to determine your client's risk tolerance. Are you including all those things that we've just discussed? It's all about thinking more critically about what it is that you're trying to measure, measuring that as appropriately as possible, and then using that information to recommend a suitable portfolio for your client. Okay, now that I've shown you how flawed risk tolerance questionnaires are, I've hopefully convinced you that even if we improve those questionnaires, there's still a vital role for you to play as the financial planner. I mean, I can do an entirely separate presentation just talking about the value of this relationship. But in order for you to maximize value for your client, you need to learn how to read your client's behavior, ask the right question, and manage your own biases. And yes, while we're talking about risk tolerance here, it's not necessarily the starting point of the conversation. Let me explain. If we start with assessing risk tolerance, the next natural step is to advise on an asset allocation based on that risk tolerance. That asset allocation is then going to determine the returns that you earn, and those returns then dictate the lifestyle that you're going to have. Let's switch that around. What lifestyle does your client want to have? What are the returns that they need to be earning to have that lifestyle? What assets do they need to be invested in to earn those returns? And what risk is required from them to be able to invest in those assets or to buy into that asset allocation? This is where it starts getting interesting. If your client's risk tolerance matches the risk that's required from them to earn the returns they want, to live the lifestyle they want, then there's no problem. But I'm assuming that's not often the case. So how do we go about managing that misalignment? I think there's some key things that you can do in your client interaction that can help with this. Firstly, 
how does your client define risk? I'm generalizing, but in most instances, when I talk about risk with someone, they immediately say things like, I can't afford to lose my money. That's not risk aversion, right? That's loss aversion. It's different. It speaks to the client's capacity to handle the loss. Make sure you're speaking about risk from the client's point of view. Use terms and examples that they understand. And this is where that human element is so important in your interaction with your client. Now, client education is important, but it's not the solution to everything. When it comes to the terminology we use in around risk, change the way you frame it and talk about it with the same language as your client. When structuring a portfolio for clients, there are obvious ways to ensure that they have sufficient cash or cash equivalent products to ensure that they have that emergency fund and sufficient liquidity that they don't need to realize any losses. They're then just paper losses. A talk for another time. Second, do they realize that risk is inevitable? And this speaks a little to client education. But if you ask someone if they want to experience pain after surgery, they'll obviously say no. But pain is inevitable, and if you need the surgery, you'll push through the pain. Likewise, risk is inevitable, but you need to tolerate it to earn the returns that you want. And this is where your role as a financial planner is really put to use. Right? Running the numbers is the easy part. Your role is relational. It's a trust relationship. You need to go and accurately assess your client's risk tolerance and the risks that they're required to earn the returns that they want, and where there's a misalignment there, you need to manage it through a combination of client education and reframing things in their own language. Thirdly, don't give them too many options. I could do a whole third presentation where I just talk about the human struggle with making decisions and information overload. And in some instances, the fact that an information is difficult to understand makes it even more perilous. So why give them the option? You need to value your expertise. Believe in your ability to advise appropriately. And it goes without saying that such advice should be driven by a value proposition for the client, not a product commission structure. Finally, because you're in the regulatory space, document, protect yourselves, have written evidence of these conversations. It's too risky not to. In summary, you need to be aware of the diagnostic tool you're using to assess risk tolerance, and you need to be mindful of the language you're using with your clients or how you're framing things. In short, your job is to manage the gap between the risk your client can tolerate and the risk that they require to earn the returns they want to achieve the lifestyle they want. On the diagnostic side, be cautious. If you're using questionnaires or tools similar to questionnaires, be mindful of the limitations. We think these questionnaires are potentially too cautious that they're missing important variables and that there's too much self-assessment. But we only looked at a sample. Take the information and apply it to whatever diagnostic tool you're using. Fundamentally, remember that it's difficult to measure someone's risk tolerance. And given that it changes over time and with different events, it's not a static outcome. Fortunately, it's only one piece of the puzzle. By balancing client education and framing things in your client's language, you can build trust and manage that gap. Ask the right questions, listen to their responses, and manage your own biases or preconceived ideas. And do this continuously as the market moves, as life events happen. Continually gather information, educate, reframe, educate, reframe. You're the expert here, remember that. You know the answer, but your role is to manage your client's behavior and mindset. And that will only come with time, if you're listening and reading them properly. But it's well worth the investment. I really hope you've enjoyed the talk and if anyone has any questions or wants to know anything further, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me.